Welcome back to another episode of History on the Hill. My name is Monique Sugimoto. I am the archivist and local history librarian here with the Palos Verdes Library District. And we are in the local history center located at the Peninsula Center Library. Today, we have a very special guest with us, um, Richard Kawasaki. Um, Richard uh, has been volunteering with the library for what, 18 years now, Richard? Pretty much. Pretty much, 18 years. And it's not just one day a week, it's often. Um, recently, he's been coming two days a week and even uh, putting in some time on the weekends. Um, and Richard uh, has been volunteering with us for our project that we called the 40 Families Project. And the 40 Families Project is a project to document uh, the Japanese farming and, and the agriculture on the peninsula um, over time. As we know, the agriculture was a really big part of the peninsula. Um, especially prior to World War II. And uh, this project is trying to document the farmers um, who farmed this area. Um, I always like to start off with this photograph. Richard, do you remember this photograph? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, this photograph is one of the early photographs that we have. Uh, and I, I love it because it says information office turn in here. Um, this was taken actually 100 years ago. But the significant thing about it is, yes, the cool cars that are in it, but it's the vegetables and it's actually the agriculture behind, the, um, behind this uh, that really I find um, so interesting. So this, this was the land office uh, when they started building in, in the estates. That's right. So this is over in Malaga Cove. Um, and you can see that, yes, at that time, um, and this was actually 100 years ago, uh, 201913, it'll be well, exactly 100 years ago. And that's when this photograph was taken. So we had agriculture at that time, um, you know, uh, here on the peninsula. Okay. So to get started, Richard, why don't you tell us a little bit um, about yourself and how you got uh, involved with this project? Okay. Well, my, my family is originally from San Francisco, but my mother's family farmed here in Palos Verdes. And she was a, almost a child bride at the age of 18. And married a man in San Francisco. So she lived in San Francisco until after the war, and that's where the main part of my family grew up. I was born in 1942 in a Topaz relocation center in Utah, central Utah. And after the war, we went back to San Francisco, but it was, wasn't very long afterwards. The family packed up and we came down to Los Angeles where most of our families on my mother's side lived. Uh, my, my mom was actually born on the site of the old uh, Parker Center on Jackson Street near in, San Pedro. Oh, Street. in San Pedro. Okay. No, San Pedro Street. Stamp in downtown, in, right? In downtown, downtown just Los outside right. of Little Tokyo. Yeah. She was born in a hotel there uh -huh. in 1913. But, um, from the time that we moved to Los Angeles, uh, we took maybe one or two trips every year to Palos Verdes. I, was, uh, I grew up in South Central LA, where most of us uh, congregated in what's now called the, the Sanon District of Los Angeles. That's roughly the area that's near, maybe west of the Coliseum, uh, up to about Oh, Crenshaw, south of Adams, and north of Santa Barbara Street, or what's now Martin Luther King. But uh, we would take trips down to Palos Verdes. One, one was almost mandatory. That was because they had a Palos Verdes reunion every year. And we would uh, come to one of the local beaches, either White Front, White Point, yeah. <laughs> White Front. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that place, but no. uh, White Point or Abalone Cove. I think once we did go to Portuguese Bend Club, uh -huh. but uh, the farmers there, the Ishibashi family, would organize the, the annual get-together. Uh, the other times we just come down to visit. 
and we would buy vegetables from the Ishibashi family. Uh, of course, we always brought gifts. That was mm -hmm. a Japanese tradition. We always brought either candy or some Japanese confections or flowers. Flowers is kind of a funny thing because early on, they weren't growing flowers, they were growing vegetables. And so we would bring flowers, they would give us vegetables. And that was something that happened until they started growing flowers. Then we had to find something <laughs> else to give. knew to give, yes. <laughs> I came here yeah. not knowing what I was getting into. Yeah, tell us how you got, tell us how you got involved in the 40 it, Families it's, Project. Okay, <laughs> it, it's kind of more of a convoluted story. <laughs> I, I was working for the city of Lomita and um, as, a get, city planner. At, as a city planner, <laughs> I, was, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And after the first couple of visits with my doctor, I decided, you know, this is not good. I mean, prostate cancer is something that might or might not take you real quick. So I said, well, I better start thinking about retiring. While I was in treatment, I met a librarian uh, who worked here, and he suggested that I look here to see if I can find some retirement activity. And he told me to look up Marjean Blinn, who was Monique's My predecessor. predecessor. Uh, Marjean was in the process of moving all the historical materials from Malaga Cove Library up to here because they had designated this room. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came looking for her, I went to the desk, they said, go look in that room over there. And I came in here and Marjean was rummaging around with books and whatever. And she looks up and she says, oh, look at that picture. And that picture pretty much was where, where it is today. It is, it's been there for, yeah. Well, it's not that, not that exact picture because I guess we've yeah, we got, new, it. got some donations to we get got a new. donation, eight, that's right. And anyway, she says, I'd like you to look into that and find out all about those people. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I want to know their names, what happened to them, who are those kids? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> interesting. And you know, this picture was taken in 1923. 1923, When, almost when I was, first walked in, it was 2004. And um, you don't expect uh, many of those people to be alive in, in 80 years, but there were some. There were some, and even when I came, I actually had somebody come in and point herself out on the photograph. So she was already in her 90s. Yeah. And, and I she, was lucky enough to interview one or two of those yes, people in there. I think, you found, I think you met that person as well. She was teasing her sister. They came in together. The sister was too young to be in the photograph. <laughs> so she said, you're not in this photograph. And then one of the more notable residents of, of the farming community here, Jimmy Ishibashi, he claims he was here. He says he remembers that event. Yeah, in the photograph? In the event, but he could not find himself, nor could any of his family. And he says, well, I, I was kind of a rambunctious kid at that time. I, I guess I was running around being a naughty kid, and I just wasn't uh, in the or organization. Yes. <laughs> so but, how, when you're researching this, tell us a little bit about um, how you go about researching them. Well, first of all, uh, you had to find out names. Right. So we started, in a, and luckily we he had access to Ancestry.com. Mm -hmm. So I was able to download the 1920 census for Palos Verdes, the 1930 census. Much later on, we got the 1940, and I'm still kind of looking for the 1950 to uh, the 1950. get access. The 1950 is my is my thing because that's post-war and that gives there's, us there's some really good stuff in there. Good stuff in there, especially about who came yeah. back, who didn't come back. Right. You know what kind of farming. Sorry, sorry, I digress. Well, <laughs> the, no. In Jimmy's uh, interview, he says, "Oh yeah, there was a Mr. and Mrs. Kitagawa up at the top of the hill." I'm thinking, I've never heard that name. Yeah. Who are these people? Um, and I can't find any information on them, except I have to wait for the 1950 census. Which is out now. Um, but not and, available right. through Ancestry. Yeah. Um, but I've looked through the phone directory, apparently no phone. <laughs> but yeah. We'll find out. But he said about a month uh, up at the top of the hill, I'm guessing maybe he took over the, uh, uh, was it the Akiyoshis? 
or no, the Murugishis. The Murugishis? They, they were yeah. farming. Oh, I have this file right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. They were, weren't they farming in yes. Rolling Hills? That they was were... the first time we ever had a, a clue that anybody farmed anywhere except on the coast. Right, the, we had the Murugishi file. Yep, that's a really good file. Mr. Murugishi was from an area called Shiga mm -hmm. Prefecture, which is on the Japan Sea side of the island, the main island. Um, the son-in-law, or proposed son-in-law, Aki Kadonaga, mm -hmm. was from where my grandparents were from, Totori mm -hmm. Prefecture, which is not too far from Shiga. They're, they're abutting prefectures. Uh -huh. But that was enough to set off alarms because in, in those days before the war, at least the, the Totori people were very careful about who their children were marrying, and they really wanted their children to marry other people from the same prefecture. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what that was all about, except <clears throat> that maybe they were able to go into the, the family records and find out if they were a good family or not. Right. Well, so they had this difficulty. <clears throat> they, got in, they wanted to get engaged, in camp in Poston in late 1945. <clears throat> but, and I'm not sure if both families were against it, but at least the, uh, the, the son-in-law's family didn't want it to happen. Then steps in my, my grandmother, who at that time probably was pushing something like four foot nine or four foot 10. <laughs> And I never realized that as quiet as she was during the time that I knew her well, she was kind of the leader of the women in Palos Verdes. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And I didn't realize that until I started seeing her picture in, in some of the group pictures of Palos Verdes, the women's club, the, the school, the language school club, or board or whatever it was called. Right. Maybe called the PTA. Uh, but she was seated in the middle, and she always had like a dark dress and a hat. And uh -huh. You know, that, maybe that does mean something. Well, she stepped in and told both sides to let the kids marry. And it was not that big a deal for the kids to marry just because their their families are from different parts of Japan. Oh my gosh, it's so amazing. Yes. And you know, that was the beginning of a lot of this uh, really reaching out. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they had already seen some of this because one of the effects of going into the, these camps was that where families were, would start off maybe the first week or so, they were eating on the same table. After that, the kids started wandering off mm -hmm. and the kids would have their own table and by, by age group. So the teens would have a teen group table, okay. and then the little guys would go to the... So pretty soon they realized they were losing control of these kids. And I think that was all part of it. Uh, that's a phenomenon that happened in every single camp during the war, oh, where, where the kids got more independent. Uh, they, they met the loves of their lives there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the parents realized that you know, some of their power was gone. Mm -hmm. they, they just didn't have it anymore. Well, you bring up a, an interesting point about um, camp and meeting in camp. And I think that is, uh, if we come back to the peninsula history, isn't that where um, James Hatano actually meets or is a little bit more involved with the Ishibashi family? Yeah, I mean, you know. They I, were in the area in Redondo Beach, of course, but. well. That that was back, I think, in the 20s. His uh, James's father was a flower grower in Redondo Beach, but he pulled up his stakes and went to the central uh, California area. I think it oh. was Delano, and I'm not sure if he's still growing flowers or if he changed to some kind of other farming. Uh, but James, I don't think, really ever knew much about Redondo Beach, or Palos Verdes for that matter. Uh, but, as by coincidence, his family was put into Poston 
and he was in Block 226 with oh, that's the Palos Verdes farm. Right, that Block 226 is that photograph that you that's donated. Right, right. Yeah. And we scoured that picture to look for James, but couldn't identify. Yeah, him. we could not identify him in that photograph. Well, maybe, we'll maybe to... with some of the other photos we could find. Maybe him. so. Maybe yeah. so. We we identified him in a couple of these other ones, yeah. but yeah. So James met uh, and and the guys his age were guys who had just become heads of their families yeah. in Palos Verdes, the, the Ishibashis, let's see, I think one of the families, the, the James Ishibashi family went to Utah, so they didn't go to Poston, but the, uh, the Mas Ishibashi family and the other younger brothers of the Ishibashis went to Poston. They were in Poston. So they, they knew James pretty well, I think. They were all about the same age, within mm -hmm. maybe five or 10 year age difference. And what, it took what, uh, five years for James to decide to pull up and come down to Palos Verdes? Cause well, it's in the 50s, we know that, right? Yeah. And at that time, I guess some of the, uh, the farmers who did come back to Palos Verdes went somewhere else. They decided that was it. And James was able to find land yep. that, and just took over a lease or two. Yep, that's right. And I'm not sure where he farmed first. Um, obviously, he was farming where the remnants are right now, but I think he might have had some other plots closer to things like Marine Land or whatever. Well, yeah, according to, well, if, if you're following the, the Rancho Palos Verdes um, material, and I also think in some of the newspaper articles that, he, that we have, he was farming or uh, at 13 acres, so they, were, they had 13 acres, and then I think slowly it just mm. kind of got dwindled, dwindled down to the, the four, three or four acres that it is right now. So, Richard, tell us what kind of your your typical day is when you're when you're in here. Okay, first thing I do it is I well I I have now I have a stack of stuff and it's just waiting to 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 be worked on because you've been ordering these A files. Yeah. Um, and, and my impression is that they, they create these files, even if you don't go through naturalization, that if you have traveled to Japan and wanted a re-entry, they, they make a file for you. Because he's, he's, I don't think he's ever done it. Um, I, the, the A files are a specific file. So mm -hmm. that is, um, these are the files that are created by the former Immigration and Naturalization mm -hmm. Service. Um, and we're able to get these because these people were born prior, well, we can get them and the, because they're public records after a certain number of years. Um, but they, uh, when you are going to become a citizen or you are applying, mm -hmm. they, they create a, or a file is created oh. for you. Yeah. Okay, because I, mean, for, I, but yeah, the I never found any kind of application for some of these folks that we have A files for. But the only thing I have is that Yes, they immigrated. They have so they have records of their initial immigration. Yes, and then they have records of when they went to Japan or left the country and wanted to come back in. Right. So this this fellow, I think, went back twice. Yeah. And probably because some relative had passed away in Japan, and he wanted to go through okay. services, and she went back once. So in this file, we don't have um, we don't have his uh, request to naturalize. Right. The petition. Oh, interesting. Okay. Nor, nor hers. Uh, or not in, in hers. Right. Okay. Interesting. Which I really look forward to because those things really have a lot of information. Yep. And what what they have is every activity in every residence that took place after they first got here. Exactly. It follows them. Because usually I don't have a clue. I mean, right. These folks, I think they they came to the U.S. Uh, with the destination of Fresno. And they, they had some fell, uh, close friend or maybe a relative that lived there and they were gonna sponsor them for a little while and uh, they spent a couple years in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about these guys is that I was able to find out that their first daughter was born in Fresno, oh, okay. 1922. Yeah. The second daughter was born in Palos Verdes. Oh, okay. So, so that, I knew pretty much when they moved down here exactly. and why they should be in that picture. picture exactly, yes. Oh, you know what? The, the, uh, you're right. The A file that we're looking at is an alien registration file. So if you are you, you are registering, you know, mm -hmm. to be 
uh, yeah. in, as an alien. So that's what the A file is. And if coincidentally you happen to have um, applied for citizenship, then that that material that gets put into your in A there, file, yeah. and that's, that's exactly great to right. have. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Uh, sometimes let's see, they had to report change of address. Yeah. Oh, all the time. Yeah. And especially after the war. Um, yeah. So every back. single one of these says, "Okay, I've left Poston. I'm I'm moving to wherever." Right. Yeah. So you go through these piles of records, and what else do you do? Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I look through these files. Mm -hmm. I go through Ancestry, try to find out information about their children uh -huh. or any close relatives. And then I try to write a story, uh -huh. starting from when he came to America, uh -huh. when they got married. Uh -huh. And most of the time, the husband goes back to Japan, finds a wife, brings them back. Right, a, a picture bride. No. Not really a picture, because oh, these, oh, okay. so these, these two came from the same town. Okay, so, they, so this one is not one of the picture brides. Right, I yeah. think they knew each other, or their families were close enough they knew each other. Uh, but in some cases, the husband comes back, the wife comes back maybe a, a year or two years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, in some cases, uh, they did have picture brides. Right. And I, mean, I think in a couple of cases that I've looked at, there weren't any pictures. The guy was told, go to Seattle, meet your wife, and we'll go from there. Well, right. we found records of at least two or three yep. of our farmer folk, folks who went to Seattle, uh, met, met the woman off, coming off the boat, right. went straight to the county offices, they got married there. Yep, because because uh, the U.S. did not recognize a marriage that was performed in Japan, so they would have to come here, go directly to the church or city office or whatever, and get married. Yeah, what I found out is in Japan at that time, marriage was pretty easy. I mean, in Japan. In Japan, yeah. yeah you didn't have to do anything special, and in a lot of cases, they didn't even go through any kind of a ceremony. Oh, interesting. When the whole Hatano um, farm issue came up in, in uh, Rancho Palos Verdes, we started doing research on the on the Hatano um, family, and we have a new file that we have been creating and adding information into. Mm -hmm. And um, the granddaughter of uh, James Hatano actually sent me these photographs, and you know it, it's really interesting. This is the one of their marriage. Um, here is one where they are actually farming, and I think this is in Redondo Beach, um, and even one of flowers, um, and I know from newspaper articles that James Hitano actually got um, awards for, for, some of the, for some of the flowers. And it's really interesting, there's even a book that was written by Naomi um, Hirahara uh, called Ascent of Flowers, and it's the history of the Southern California flower market. So in addition to, you know, our early time where we have, um, you know, vegetable growers uh, prior to World War II, and of course afterwards, but we get a lot of flower growing um, at that time as well. And that, in addition to the vegetables, was also a significant um, part, I think, of the, of the peninsula's history. And I love these um, photo, you know, this is their table assignment in 1952, and you can see that um, Hatano is at table 103 um, in this. But there's also this lovely photograph of him um, in here in Palos Verdes. So this is actually, isn't this really neat? That we can see him in, you know, actually at the, the, the cap, where the current cap is. That's the way I remember him. Oh, I didn't meet him until about that age. Oh, so you met him, yeah. I met him yeah. once or twice. Oh my gosh. Through the 40 Families Project? Uh, no, actually through the reunion, the Palos oh, through Verdes the reunion. Reunions, because he would go he to would the reunions. Up, yeah. He would show up the, at the reunions. There were others that came from Central California that joined the community. Oh, I see, after that, yeah. You know, Richard, um, I'm reminded of a research project that we were just working on, and that was because we got a clue that the Ishibashi family actually did not come from Northern California. They actually came to the United States through Mexico. Um, and that is just fascinating that we can see um, kind of the people migration uh, or migrating, you know, the, the different routes that they took to get here, establishing their families, you know, wherever it is, and mm -hmm. trying to make the best um, for their own families 
um, as they got here. And it's because we can get records, we can, you know, we can order records, we have materials, we just need to put them all together. And it's the research that we're able to do here that uh, allows us to, you know, document this really important piece of our peninsula history. And, and you do a lot of it. Yeah, one of the things was that we didn't realize that uh, when you crossed the border, you had to show some proof that you were able to defend for yourself for a while. And I guess you had to have a certain number of dollars to, to show the border official or some uh, document that says you're going to go to work for some place. And at the same time, there were guys who might be called coyote today mm -hmm. who were there in case you didn't have either. Mm -hmm. And they, you would sign a contract. Well, Mr. Ishibashi on Jimmy Ishibashi's side came through Mexico and he didn't have any way of showing that he could take care of himself. Mm -hmm. He signed a contract to work in coal mining and I think also a, a railroad job, mm -hmm. which may or may not be related in some way, but he had to sign a contract one or two years mm -hmm. uh, to, to work before he could join his brother here in California. Yeah. And it, it amazed me that this happened uh, as part of kind of an organized effort through the Japanese and American yeah. governments. Yeah, at that time, it was really, it, it, that was, um, I mean, the Japanese government needed the assistance in the U.S. as well. I mean, we were able to do that. So they had recruiters in Okinawa and Hiroshima and one other yeah. area. And I just realized, oh gosh, you know, my wife's relatives from Okinawa were recruited to go to Hawaii, mainly because they knew how to handle sugar cane and pineapples. Mm -hmm. So they would go that The way. guys from Hiroshima were sent to Mexico. Mm -hmm. They landed in, in, a, in a port that I never heard about until yep, we until started we looking at it. Some of those guys had to work in coal mines in Mexico. Well, maybe not another. coal mining. I'm not sure what kind of mining they did. S some but type they of were mining. Mi mining in Mexico for a year or two before they could mm -hmm. afford to come through the border. Yeah. And uh, if they were lucky, they had enough money to, to move on further. Right. So it's uh, it's incredible that we're, uh, you know, it's because you are doing all of this research that we're able to document um, our families and um, the people who make up the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming and telling us all about this. It's, it's really been um, wonderful, and we hope that you have enjoyed this episode of History on the Hill. If you'd like to um, learn more and meet Richard, I encourage you to do so. That would be on a Tuesday morning or Wednesday afternoons when Richard is here. We invite you to come and, um, to come and learn more about our history. And we also thank you for, um, for watching these episodes of History on the Hill. It's really been fun, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.